This lecture will focus on muscle energy techniques. There is not a chapter for muscle energy within the Starkey text or the Knight and Draper text. Therefore, all information for the examination will be contained within this lecture. So what is the muscle energy technique? It is the voluntary contraction of the patient's muscle in a precisely controlled direction at varying levels of intensity against a distinctly executed counterforce that is applied by the practitioner. Muscle energy sounds complicated to execute, but once we understand a little bit more about terminologies and different theories, the practicality and the application of muscle energy really isn't that difficult. Several theories and terminologies can help us to understand the concept of muscle energy. First is the length tension relationship. The length tension relationship is the observation that the isometric force exerted by a muscle is dependent upon its length when tested. The length tension relationship can likely be explained by the interactions between two underlying mechanisms, the active and the passive length tension relationships. In simplistic terms, when a muscle is either in a shortened or a lengthened position, it will be inhibited, which means that it cannot exert a maximum force. Second is the reciprocal inhibition. Reciprocal inhibition describes the process of muscles on one side of a joint relaxing to accommodate contraction on the other side of that joint. Joints are controlled by two opposing sets of muscles, extensors and flexors, which must work in synchronicity for smooth movement to occur. The contraction in a muscle, known as the agonist, would result in an accompanied loss of tone or relaxation in the opposing or antagonist muscle. Third, the definition of an isometric contraction. An isometric muscle contraction, or static exercise, is one in which the muscle fires, but there is no movement at the joint. In other words, the joint is static, there is no lengthening or shortening during the contraction. The primary use for muscle energy is the correction of postural malalignments. Postural malalignments could come from various factors. Muscles that are overly lengthened are inhibited and become weak. Because these muscles are lengthened and are weak, other muscles have to take over, which then causes those muscles to become overactive. Muscles that are shortened lose elasticity and become tight. We need to get these muscles loose again or we lose range of motion. The goal of muscle energy is to restore normal muscle length, posture, normal biomechanics, and to mobilize joints that are restricted. Postural malalignments can happen in many different areas of the body. One of the areas most commonly affected is the spine. We can see images of good posture, moderate problems, and severe problems. Muscle energy can be utilized to help individuals with moderate and severe problems try to become realigned or as close to good posture as possible. Upper and lower cross syndromes are examined in this slide. Upper cross syndrome frequently results in a forward head and rounded shoulders posture. Upper cross syndrome is also referred to as proximal or shoulder girdle cross syndrome. In upper cross syndrome, tightness of the upper trapezius and levator scapula on the dorsal side crosses with the tightness of the pectoral major and minor. Weakness of the deep cervical flexors crosses with weakness of the middle and lower trapezius. This pattern of imbalances creates joint dysfunction, particularly at the atlanto-occipital joint, C4-C5 segment, cervical thoracic joint, glenohumeral joint, and the T4-T5 segment. Lower cross syndrome is referred to as distal or pelvic cross syndrome. In lower cross syndrome, tightness of the thoracolumbar extensors on the dorsal side crosses with the tightness of the iliopsoas and rectus femoris. Weakness of the deep abdominal muscles ventrally crosses with the weakness of the gluteus maximus and medius. This pattern of imbalance creates joint dysfunction, particularly at the L4-L5 and L5-S1 segments. 
the SI joint, and the hip joint. Specific postural changes are seen in lower cross syndrome, including anterior pelvic tilt, increased lumbar lordosis, lateral lumbar shift, lateral leg rotation, and knee hyperextension. If the lordosis is deep and short, then imbalance is predominantly in the pelvic muscles. If the lordosis is shallow and extends into the thoracic area, then imbalance predominates in the trunk muscles. To perform the muscle energy technique, first we need to evaluate our patient. It is really common to have a lower extremity cross in a patient population. We will need to locate the anterior superior iliac spine, also known as the ASIS, and the posterior superior iliac spine, also known as the PSIS. We can locate the anterior superior iliac spine by placing our hands on the iliac crest of the patient as they're standing in front of us facing us. Typically, where our thumbs hit is the most proximate portion of the hip. We will then locate the posterior superior iliac spine by having our patient turn around. You can locate someone's lower back dimples. That is approximately where the posterior superior iliac spine is located. In the muscle energy technique, you will need to determine which way the pelvis is shifted. Is it an anterior rotation or a posterior rotation? We look at the ASIS and the PSIS to determine which rotation is happening. Once you have decided on the rotation, you will need to know anatomy to determine what is pulling the pelvis in which direction. In the muscle energy technique, we have the participant complete isometric contractions for 5 to 10 seconds. For example, if the hip flexors are tight, the patient is going to have an anteriorly rotated pelvis. If we are to treat this condition, we would need to activate the antagonist of the shortened or tight muscles. The hip flexors, primarily the iliopsoas and the rectus femoris, would be in a contracted state as the agonist muscles. During muscle energy, we would need to perform a 5 to 10 second isometric gluteus maximus contraction. When the antagonist muscle is activated, the agonist muscle or muscles relax. We would repeat this technique three to five times and then we would reevaluate the patient to see if it had an effect. This is an example of only one side of the hips being rotated. This would be a unilateral anterior tilt. When evaluating the patient's anterior superior iliac spine levels on both sides, one side would be pulled down towards the thigh more than the other. In this case, the tight hip flexor on a single side is pulling the pelvis forward, which results in an elongation and inhibition of the gluteus maximus. With the gluteus maximus being inhibited, there's a group that has to take over, which is the hamstrings. The hamstrings take over hip extension, which causes them to become overactivated. By contracting the gluteus maximus, the hip flexors will relax. The tight, shortened hip flexor or hip flexors will elongate, thus restoring normal positioning. This is the shotgun technique. First, the patient is placed in a hook-lying position. The legs are both extended and the medial malleoli are examined to determine which leg appears longer. The legs are then pushed into the chest and then brought back out. The patient is then placed again in a hook-lying position we have the patient then perform repetitive AD and abduction in isometric fashion for 5 to 10 seconds, and then we pull the legs back out straight to reevaluate the medial malleoli to see if a shift has occurred. Please make sure that you complete quiz number 14. You will have 10 minutes to complete the quiz, and it will be worth 10 points.